it's my pleasure to officially start um, track two. As you know, for this conference on the future of multilateral diplomacy, we're now moved in the phase of um, tracks. We have five parallel tracks. This is track two on practices, protocol, and procedures. And for this track, we have a, a fantastic lineup. Uh, to be honest, I, I could not wish um, for more. So let me just briefly introduce um, all the speakers for this track. So we have with us Professor Rebecca Adler-Nissen, who is a professor at the Department of Political Science at the University of Copenhagen, Denmark. We have Ms. Dalia Salinas, who is the head of the consular section of the Embassy of Mexico uh, in Norway. Then we have Ambassador Amma Agiwaili from the Embassy of Egypt in Serbia. Last but not least, Professor Cornelio Bjoyla, who is an assist associate professor of diplomatic studies at the University of Oxford. You've probably seen the format for these tracks uh, in our program. So we will dedicate 15 minutes of discussion with each of our speakers to kind of get their take on the situation and then to kind of deepen the discussion with them based on your questions and comments. We will have a 15 minute coffee break in between. Also, let me just remind you again, we try to make this as interactive as possible, which means we're looking for your questions and your comments, which you can submit in the chat. If you would like to come in by voice or video, also give us a note in the chat and we will try to make sure to, to bring you in. I'm also supported today by my colleague, Pavlina Itelson, who keeps a very close eye on the chat, just to make sure we don't uh, miss anything. Having said all that, and because we have, um, a quite tight schedule and we want to give justice to each of our excellent speakers. I would like to give the floor to our first speaker, as I said, Professor Rebecca Adler-Nissen. And the title of this segment is, is a quite interesting one. And I basically want to start off with asking for um, a bit of uh, details and explanation on this. So the title is Diplomats as Mediators of Estrangement. Rebecca, could you? <clears throat> give us a few more details on that, what your thinking is and how you approach this. Right, so um, thank you so much um, for, for inviting me on, on, on this interesting panel. So the reason why I think I got this title, The Mediation of Estrangement, is both, of course, that it, it's kind of one of those old definitions uh, of diplomacy um, by James Dedarian, who introduced it as a kind of um, more broadly theoretical assumption of what dip diplomats do. And it kind of resonates with a lot of literature um, on diplomacy, that diplomacy is basically relations, right? <laughs> that should come as no surprise. But the question then happens is, well, what, what goes on then in a, in a situation where all of a sudden we find ourselves in situations of social distancing, of COVID-19, of lockdowns? What happens to that traditional um, handshake. And I'm going to share a few slides with you just to give you a, a sense of what I'm talking about, if that's okay. Um, so what happens? Well, we asked ourselves this question. I'm working here with uh, Christine Egeling, uh, who's part of my research team um, in Copenhagen. Um, and we, we have a project called Diploface, which is funded by the European Research Council, really dealing with what happens to diplomacy um, including the relationship between confidential diplomacy and public display. And we use the EU as a kind of laboratory for this. And here's just one visualization of, 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 of this. Um, as you can, you, you can see, uh, this is a, <laughs> a well-known picture for now for, for most of us. Um, and here's a pre-COVID-19 image, right? The good old days, it seems now far away, where we could, we could shake hands, we could, we could hug, and European leaders, leaders all over the world, could actually meet more intimately face to face. This is now the new Asian version, um, adopted more or less uh, eloquently. And it relates to the questions of this panel, I think, because if diplomacy is indeed about relations, and here I'm gonna just list a number of books Here's one more by, uh, by one of my fellow panelists. Um, how are they, these relations disrupted or not by, by what's going on these days? So on the one hand, we would expect this to be really disrupted, right? Because distance, as uh, Fernand Baudel would say, you know, this is really the enemy of, of diplomacy, 
you know, if we can't meet face to face, how can we build trust? How can we eventually actually understand each other? This argument comes in different uh, aspects, but it's very, very dominant, not just in diplomatic studies, but in negotiation theory much more broadly. And I think it's intuitive to most of us, but I think diplomacy has an answer that that's alternative because if you look at the the idea of diplomacy as the mediation of estrangement then all of a sudden social distance um, becomes kind of a precondition it's a necessary companion to diplomatic encounters because not just because we need to be polite and have some kind of distance in our you know intersubjective relations but also because we can't go native as it were we can't go too intimate and I think Paul Schaub formulated it quite eloquently by saying, well, basically diplomacy is also a meeting from which you're expected to return to your own state, right? So there is a delicate issue here that maybe actually diplomacy is really uh, perfectly placed to deal with COVID-19 because it's all about the right social distance. So we asked ourselves, um, having done field work in Brussels, having done tons of interviews pre-corona and didn't know that we would be sort of all of a sudden under lockdown, what happened to the participants, our informants? And I'll just give you th three examples of what happened. So when, when asked about how they dealt with being sent home, here's one of the things, um, the three sort of coping mechanisms they, they, they would share with us or that we would observe. One is simulating the atmosphere of the meeting. So you'd still dress up, you would still have your flag, you would still uh, maintain a lot of the rituals that go into um, a diplomatic encounter. Of course, the, the more you move up hierarchy, the more this is important. The second one is upholding a frame. This is the idea that you still stick, you continue, you stick to the routines and the rules. And the third one is a performance of togetherness. This is very characteristic, I think, of many multilateral institutions. You want to not only perform individual statehood, but you want to you want to perform a sense of we're in it together. Um, we're heroes almost because we ensure the show goes on. Here's uh, the prime minister of Denmark, where I come from. It looks like she's at a European council meeting as always, but actually she's in the, in the department and she's trying to sort of look at the way she placed the camera in the back of the photo here. You can see it's about appearances, really. Making sure it looks as if, you know, um, things are still normal. And here's another quote uh, from an ambassador at Kuiper who was explaining, you know, oh, the media, this is being portrayed as if the EU is close to falling apart because of lockdowns and we don't agree on anything. But I can tell you, it's most definitely not. The biggest change is maybe that we now have to negotiate with open doors, that there are less people in the room and that we can no longer shake hands or kiss. But in substance, it's all the same. It all depends on Germany, how we will get on with this crisis since France does not have money and the usual North, South, East, West rivalries persist. But do note one thing, the ambassadors, the co ambassadors insisted that they, their work was so unique and that face-to-face -face meetings were so important that they still need to meet face-to-face -face, and they still do. They've done that throughout the entire um, Corona crisis. Even though their heads of states meet virtually, they still meet face to face in a bigger room. The final uh, uh, sort of coping mechanism is this idea that we, we are still integrating. And here's just one visual of that. So we usually have the group photos you're very familiar with in this foundation and I guess the audience, but of course it takes a different look. Um, and this all relates to sort of the big question I guess we all have is how long will this last? And this is also something diplomacy diplomats ask themselves. Most of them say, oh, well, they can't wait to, to go back to normal. But there is this increasing sense that, um, first of all, we need to embrace the uncertainty that we don't know when this will be over. And also that this new normal might become the old normal, that this will become how things work. And there is one um, sort of very ambiguous quote here from from some field notes we did. I'm sure that we'll learn a lot from everything that we have achieved. We will have more video conferences for a good part of the council work at the technical and expert level, but from other parts, we will try to return to the old normal very soon. This is a prediction made in May. I think actually the opposite might be the case that we will have our leaders meeting increasingly online, but still most of the sort of preparatory work 
could be done um, in Brussels, but who knows? So this was just um, uh, some examples from our work, um, a little snapshot into how, how this looks, um, how this might be performed. Um, and I'm happy to, to, to continue the conversation, not least because I know there are so many other excellent people on this panel whom I'm extremely inspired by. So it's, it's really a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Rebecca. It's, it's really interesting, especially what you say about distance is not necessarily the enemy of diplomacy. And then those uh, coping mechanisms that you outlined that we, we can see, but to have them framed in that way, that these are actually coping mechanisms to continue diplomatic relations is, I think, really, really helpful and really insightful. Um, you mentioned your research, that the research started way before COVID, and then obviously things changed quite a bit because of COVID, um, and how your informants uh, gave some insights into, into these shifts. Um, we have one question that uh, asks us to look a bit deeper into the kind of challenges they faced as social distancing came into place and obviously first the lockdown came into place. Uh, what kind of complaints they raised and uh, or challenges they mentioned and how they specifically um, coped with that. Do you, do you have any suggestions from what the people in, in the field, uh, the diplomats in the field told you there? Yes, so um, lots, lots of uh, issues and lots of problems, and I guess it, they can be sort of divided into more practical um, problems of uh, technological know-how um, and and just uh, setting this up. Um, another uh, sort of group of problems relates to legitimacy. I think there's a real um, uh, danger in which is kind of paradoxical, actually, that with this uh, turn to video conferencing, Zoom, etc., the press is actually left out. It should be more uh, uh, the opposite, right? It should involve it, but, but because there's no accidental bumping into each other in, in Brussels and in other multilateral settings, we actually see a, a lack of democratic oversight. And that's kind of the uh, an unintentional and kind of casual casualty of, of, of this crisis so far. This, this might, and this is changing already now, but, but they're still inventing ways to actually reach out to, 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 to a broader audience. Another thing is of course the emotional drain. And I think here um, as all diplomats are, 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 are people too. And some of these people have been locked down, especially because Brussels is so hit hot um, for months. And uh, it just is really hard for, for, for everyone. There's also a, a gender uh, issue here. Uh, so it really makes a difference whether or not you ha have small kids. Uh, so, so there will be some very unequal sort of long-term effects um, on the diplomatic cadre and practice sort of more broadly. Um, and finally, there is a sense in which when it's really, really, really difficult issues, so let's say budget discussions, if we talk the EU or Brexit, you need to be in the same room. So here, uh, there are simply also limits to, to what video conferences can do. But the, the, the idea of some kind of blended diplomacy, I think, is really emerging here, that what used to be sort of speculative or for some, something they resisted is just how it is. And, 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 and that's where I think uh, we can be ha happy that Cornelio wrote his book uh, before because they will, that will basically be how, how diplomacy works, whether they like it or not. But there's definitely resistance to this. Uh, thank you. Well, would I, uh, Cornelio, would you like to come in? Please go ahead. Um, thank you very much, Rebecca. It's a very insightful uh, uh, take on, on uh, how, how these things evolve. I have a very specific question, which I, I would like to pick on your comment on framing. Uh, uh, so also from my conversation with diplomats nowadays moving into the virtual system, how do you find them coping with this balance between formality and informality? You know, the face-to-face, -face, you have, you know, the, the space, the room, uh, the protocol, the everything. The virtual changes that, doesn't it? You know, it creates this kind of informal medium. And you said that in, in social, prison, it, uh, social presence, it cannot be too informal because it affects. Uh, so I've been wondering, you know, how, how do you find this balance, you know, uh, informality disrupting a little bit, you know, the, the, the practice of, of traditional diplomacy? Right. Um, it's, very, it's, a, it's a great question. Um, and, and, and we do also have, um, in, in some of the pa papers now uh, under review, some, some really interesting comments, even up to Angela Merkel sort of complaining, yes, you can do a lot 
online. But when it comes to the tour de table, when it comes to me walking around the table and sort of, uh, you know, in the breaks and the coffee, taking them out to a side room, that's lacking. So, so the informality of the formal meeting turns out to be really, uh, really quite a, a, a crucial part of, of making coalitions. And I can't help thinking, um, and this is a counterfactual, we'll never know, but along the lines of you, you Cornelia, that had we had real face-to-face -face meetings between the European leaders in the early days of the epidemic, I think we would have had much more coordination. I think we, you know, Italy wouldn't have had to wait so long for help because there would have been that sense, okay, you're actually in deep trouble, but that seems so distant. So there's a sense in which empathy is, is, is just, it just seems more distant. And I think we all have that feeling right now, <laughs> speaking on Zoom, it would be nice to have a real coffee sometimes. So yes, it's, it's a crucial point. It certainly would be nice to, to, have, to have a real coffee um, sometimes. Um, let me bring our next speaker into the discussion, but again, we can continue in this more informal format. But just to introduce, introduce her again, we have Ms. Dalia Salinas, who's the head of the consular section at uh, the Mexican embassy in Norway. And Dalia is uh, someone who's extremely interested in digital diplomacy, who's running um, small um, experiments, so to speak, on how to, how to really advance this in, in practice and has a project at the embassy. Um, so Dalia, perhaps you can, you can share some reflections on the opportunities and challenges in terms of digital practices um, that you see, or perhaps also reflect on, on what we've been discussing so far, if you wanna take that opportunity, uh, over to you. Thank you, Katarina. Well, thank you, everybody. I'm super thrilled to be here. Um, I just want to share very briefly a couple of observations from the practitioner's point of view. Um, and, and I just want to, to remember that uh, I think that the COVID-19 pandemic actually became a catalyst of a phenomenon that was already taking place among many foreign services. And it is that not, it was not the vast majority, but many foreign uh, ministries were already facing the imminent transition to a more digitalized world. And among them, uh, they were questioning how are we going to cope with this from the diplomatic point of view. And we were many voices, practitioners and scholars were pushing this agenda uh, in the foreign ministries. But I think there were three considerations that I have observed, not an exhaustive explanation, but I have observed three conditions that probably slowed down uh, a more agile adoption of new technologies. Uh, first, the traditional norms of procedure, you know, not only in the multilateral arena, but in general, like the tradition of a printed physical verbal note, uh, or the, the tradition of sending a very, uh, a very beautifully printed invitation for a reception. Um, these very, uh, the, we have mentioned a lot, the importance of having a physical meeting, a coffee with, with a colleague or among leaders. Uh, so these conditions were not exactly an incentive to explore digital alternatives to what we were doing. Um, second, of course, the training programs of diplomats. And, and this is something I'm saying, all that I have observed is very much in line with the report that you're presenting today, Katarina. And I, I agree with Cornelio, it's amazing. Um, it's very, very useful. Uh, we see that the training programs remain anchored in a very traditional view or approach to diplomacy. And the courses tend to to go on and of course history and international relations, but there is little that is invested in terms of skills or what actually diplomacy is as a profession. And of course there is resistance by many senior officials to adopt digital tools and the training programs are not fully invested in promoting change towards a digitalized environment. Um, and third, I think there is a very important concrete situation in terms of budgets, and stru uh, structural conditions for, for our work. 
so foreign services are subject to political decisions regarding financial allocations in, in our own countries. And there is an old, very old problem for diplomacies, which is that uh, in a world where managerial approaches to public services and governments become dominant, it became very complicated to justify the allocation of resources to a branch of government like us that cannot measure our results in a clear quantitative way. So it was very difficult to obtain the necessary support um, to first uh, adopt or explore different technologies, because of course they imply uh, software, equipment, licenses. So there, we need an investment for that. And not all diplomacies, and I see but actually the vast majority of diplomacies, were having this problem in developing countries, but also in very developed, highly developed uh, countries, uh, where diplomacies could not convey to their societies and to their ministries of finance uh, the value of our work, of what we yield to our societies. So this is a, a very structural, very important obstacle for diplomacies to acquire a different set of skills, especially to in, in terms of technology. Now, uh, I think that what happened with COVID-19 is that we were all then ended up in a situation in which, which was very uneven. I mean, uh, when, when you have diplomats in the UN, I, I don't wanna talk about the UN only, but it's very telling of what was happening in New York. I mean, people used to be in the same room Sometimes it was a delegate, sometimes it was uh, many embassies had interns that were covering for many meetings. Um, sometimes it was uh, a third secretary instead of the minister or the counselor that was covering the meeting, but it was okay because you were there representing your country. And because you have all the clearances to get into the building, it was possible. And there was not, there was not an obstacle for uh, uh, the participation of, an, uh, of a state in many meetings simultaneously. Uh, but now things are completely different and we are not under the same circumstances. Not everybody has the same access to platforms. Not everybody has the same skills or they don't know how to use them or how to profit from them. And of course, there are new unfamiliar threats, security threats in, a, in an environment where everything goes digital. So what happened is that in the UN for many online meetings, it was impossible to participate unless you were the minister, counselor, or the ambassador. So it, it restricted a lot the possibilities of a mission uh, to have the same coverage of, of these meetings. Um, of course, because we had to go very quickly and we didn't have the complete picture of what was convenient and how everybody would accommodate these situations. Um, in terms of informality, many colleagues try to, what, what we do in a, in a multilateral uh, arena is to read the room. So we try to, to get the sense of a general feeling about the subject. And through a, uh, a, a screen, it was completely impossible. So some colleagues tried to reach separately uh, other diplomats that they knew personally. And many times those uh, colleagues were not allowed to share these kind of considerations over a screen because of security concerns. So this became very disruptive. Um, very quickly, I just have to say that it's my impression as a practitioner that we have to achieve two things that are super challenging, uh, agility and equality. We have to do this fast because the, the, the stakes are very high. Uh, we've been working very intensively in terms of the, of the vaccine, for instance. And as, as far, I mean, if, if diplomats cannot be very fast, coordinating and talking among themselves, it, was, it will be very difficult to reach the level of agreement and coordination that is needed to get a real uh, equality in the distribution of the vaccine. Um, so this is just an example of how critical it is for diplomacy to actually be able to function in a digital environment. But we have to do this in a way that it's inclusive. And we have an intervention in the, in the, in the I, I, I'm sorry, I didn't write down his name. Uh, one of the interventions in the introduction that, that was very clear, this is not going to be truly inclusive unless the, the conditions for everybody are the same and not everybody, not everybody has the same uh, access to electricity or to software and licenses. So this is super important. Um, now, of course, I see this, all this also as an opportunity. Uh, for the first time, I think the diplomacies can prove that they are, even if by their absence, 
how costly it is for the whole world where the, when diplomacies cannot function. So probably we are seeing a moment in which we can convey to our capitals the importance of investing in diplomacy. But for the, I think the first condition for that is to understand what diplomacy actually is. I think we have a situation in which we have been, we've been talking about new diplomacies and the term diplomacy has traditionally been used in many ways to convey or express many different meanings. Uh, maybe this is a moment to cooperate globally uh, and trying not to achieve maybe a, a single definition. I, I, I'm not for that necessarily, but how can we become closer to what diplomacy as a profession and a strategic cost-effective tool is to better understand it and make it more clear? Second, I think this is a, a great opportunity to approximate to the value of what diplomacy yields to its society, which is something that we have been struggling for years as, as practitioners. And last, of course, what's the profile of the diplomat of the future? This is a, a question that we have been making ourselves for many years. When, when I met you in Malta, that was what we were discussing. Um, how do we train new diplomats? What kind of skills do we need from them? And how do we support them abroad? I mean, if, if back in the day we needed a building, is the building still necessary? And if so, which kind of, of infrastructure is needed so that diplomats can do their work at best? I think that would be that would be my, my first intervention. <laughs> Thank you so much. I mean, there, there's there's a lot there and a lot a, a lot to unpack. I mean, just one very um, quick reflection. Some of the challenges you outlined, or all of the challenges you outlined, are um, shared by all diplomats and in all kinds of settings. But as you also said, diplomats from small and developing countries really face an additional challenge related to resources, both financially and uh, just having the people on the ground to be able to cover these different um, these different meetings. And I think that's a, that's a real concern um, for the future. And also uh, just to reflect on in the study, we looked specifically at diplomatic hubs. So those diplomats based in New York, Geneva, Vienna, et cetera. And the question, do we still need these diplomats on the ground? And the obvious answer is, of course, yes. But there was this huge sense of concern to justify their existence, to justify their existence in, in terms of rising um, budget constraints, and especially in terms of budget constraints that are coming in the future due to states having to address the COVID-19 crisis. So then the question is, where do you put your resources? And as you said, diplomacy is a practice that is extremely important, but it's not that easy to measure, therefore not that easy to kind of uh, make that argument. Yes, but I, I will also I will also like to, to bring up one uh, something. This was a slogan in the COVID nineteen. No, nobody's safe until everybody's safe. And I think that in this case, diplomacy is something similar. Nobody's up to date until everybody is up to date. And for a diplomat that has all the equipment and all the software, it's a problem when your counterpart doesn't. So it, it is in the benefit of everybody in terms also of legitimacy for any kind of agreement, international agreement, that all countries can have a diplomacy that is operative and that has the same conditions. That's the spirit of having an organization such as the UN that provides the same level of uh, uh, the same services for everybody. And now if we're gonna do this remotely, it is very important to think, I don't know if for the first time uh, in terms of diplomacy, of global cooperation in terms of how we work as a profession. And also, I mean, I'm, I'm talking about as a profession because I am a, a professional diplomat, but I recognize also the international uh, action of NGOs and the private sector when they conduct or they intervene in diplomatic processes. That's also important. Thank you, Cornelio. I think you had a, you had a comment there. Uh, uh, yes, thank you very much, Dalia. Yeah, good to see you again. Uh, a lot of food for thought, you know, in, in what you mentioned. And you are at the forefront, you know, as a practitioner in doing these kinds of things. I have a question, maybe we can, uh, some of them address in, in, the, in the break. But one issue that uh, also seems to transpire from this uh, move online and virtual uh, is, the, is the question of transparency. Transparency meaning, uh, so when you have this kind of multilateral meetings at the UN, some of them are quite, you know, uh, well attended by the public. Um, Others now, uh, as you pointed out, you know, is more about you with your peer diplomats, right? The public is cut off. Um, so, uh, because you want to have some sort of conversation about substance of the issues and so on. Uh, I've been wondering, you know, the issue of transparency, how does it feed into your thinking about how you operate or how you 
you do this the virtual engagement. Uh, um, uh, transparency comes, especially now in times of crisis and pandemic, is seen sometimes positive because when uh, you don't have official communication, you have rumors uh, and then there's information, all kinds of things. So that's on the positive side. But if you open up too much, right, you know, you get uh, the traditional problems that we've seen on social media. So um, uh, how, how do you see this, this transparency issue from your perspective? Thank you, Cornelio. Um, well, in our, in our experience or what we have been observing in, in the, all the discussions that we have had in ter- around the vaccine, for instance, um, I think nothing has changed in, a, in essence about what the, the importance of transparency, but also the, the importance of dealing with it. I mean, uh, discretion. Discretion is uh, something that all diplomats know it's a mandatory rule to observe. And this is not about being opaque or not being uh, democratic. This is about dealing with the information, in a, especially sensitive information, in a way that is constructive for everybody. And this, when in terms of um, uh, going digital, the problem is that all diplomats, we know how to be discreet and how to protect the information of our sources and our counterparts in a traditional setting. But sometimes we are unaware or unfamiliar with other kind of threats, cyber threats, that might be uh, making us vulnerable in our communications. And the problem of bringing, uh, having a communication breach or a security breach in our negotiations, I don't have to explain it. It, it's, it could be disastrous, not only for the diplomat himself or herself, that her career might be seriously damaged, but also because we are talking about negotiations with private sector. We are talking about, uh, for instance, intellectual property. We're talking about many aspects. It's not only the government, it's also other sectors that require that kind of protection in a negoti- in a multi-stakeholder negotiation, which is more and more the, the norm uh, in, in multilateral affairs, um, that, that need that protection. So a diplomat needs to be as trustworthy as possible. And that is, of course, something that we diplomats understand in principle, but the, the way we do that in a digital sphere, it's still... Uh, very unfamiliar for us, I would say. I don't know if, if I answer to your question. <laughs> Thank you very much, Nadia. And, and there are two really interesting questions here. So the question, is trust something different when you meet in person and when you meet online, or is, is it basically the same? Or are the, the concerns um, different? For example, is trust only um, really possible when you meet face to face? And obviously it goes to uh, also like security issues, questions of cybersecurity. And, as you mentioned, Dahlia, really nicely, the, the point about some uh, missions, some countries do not have the resources to have cybersecurity measures at the, at, the, at the level it should be to really have a reasonable chance to have secure uh, conversations. So that's really interesting. And also the question of um, formality. So informality, is informality the same face-to-face as it is uh, in an online meeting? Are there different levels of informality? What are, what are the, the challenges there? I think these, these are really, really interesting questions. Yeah, well, for instance, in in terms of informality, I I find it fascinating when I listen to my colleagues in in the multilateral arena and when they tell me their stories uh, that they used to have when the the chief of states and chiefs of uh, government would meet. Of course, informality is only possible in a secure environment and an environment where both people, both uh, or all the, the people involved feels comfortable. So this is something that we haven't found yet, I think, in terms of digital tools. There is not a place that gives us the comfortable setting to make us feel at ease to share sensitive information. And this is key for diplomacy. Absolutely. Just a um, small, small um, service information for everyone. So um, we officially moved into the coffee break. I think we can continue the discussion um, informally, but if you need to stretch your legs, if you need to get up, if you actually need to get a coffee, um, please uh, feel free uh, to do so. And our next uh, speaker on the list, who is also already with us now, is His Excellency Ambassador Ama Aliwaili. Uh, good to see you. Uh, we will uh, bring you in formally in, in about 10 minutes, but there have been so many interesting comments already made um, that if, if you don't mind, I would just uh, on a very informal level continue the discussion over, over um, our coffee, if I may. 
So uh, one of one of the questions perhaps I would like to get back to is this question of transparency that Rebecca mentioned in her in her earlier intervention because I think there are two schools of thought here in terms of uh, digital diplomacy. I think my impression is that at the very beginning there was a very a, a huge sense of um, uh, opportunity and opportunity for transparency when it comes to digital diplomacy. And I think we we kind of moved away from that and perhaps have created a more realistic. Uh, picture of what, what is uh, feasible or possible in terms of um, transparency. And uh, Dahlia, as a diplomat, how do you, how do you make that, uh, how do you bridge that gap between transparency to, to the biggest extent possible for civil society, for the media, but also the necessity to maintain a level of secrecy or a level of um, uh, not making things public in order to advance negotiations, which is crucially important for diplomacy. Do you have any reflections on that, but also in relation then to, to going digital, perhaps? Yeah, well, just because it came to my mind like a flash, and I have to, to, to share with you this story. We, when we have a virtual meeting in a multilateral scene, in, we, in, in, our, in an organization we're being working, being, being very active lately, we have noticed that nowadays an advantage that somebody can have is to have actual access, personal access to someone that the rest of us cannot have, you know? So in terms of transparency, I have to say, there is also this double thing in transparency. When, when we are all in the same room and we are discussing the, the issue, I know who's in the room, who am I talking to and what resources they have at hand to deal with the, with the issue. But when we are on the screen, sometimes it's not the case. Sometimes, I don't know if you have 10 advisors behind your screen, and I think I'm talking to somebody that is alone. And I don't know if you have on your WhatsApp or you have, a uh, because you are geographically or personally linked to somebody, you have a better access to certain information that others cannot have because there is not. Uh, planes right now or their security concerns that prevent me from going there physically so I really think so, that so, yeah how, how do you react to this situation <clears throat> how do you how do you manage this situation well in our I heard from many others the same concern you know people look you know because sometimes officials don't know how to handle zoom they come with IT technicians and then the confidentiality of the discussion is broken or they may have advisors and then, you know, don't know what is going to happen with your conversation, whether it's going to end up on Twitter without, you know, leaked. <laughs> so how do you, how do you cope with this? Well, in our case, uh, what we have done so far, and I think that we, like many diplomats are trying to go to do, is to, to get, generate as much confidence as we can. And we're trying to do, to make a more intensive networking effort. I mean, I need to know not only who's in the conversation, but who these people might be talking to, you know? And uh, we are trying to gain as much trust as possible over video conferences. And this is also causing a problem for many diplomats because your workload is doubling or tripling. If you used to go to only one meeting, now you have to go to three or four virtual meetings, but you never get up you never get away from the screen and you are just trying to get a better sense of who talked to who because you don't get that info. The multitasking um, part, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I don't think it's, um, I still think that nobody's actually using it, uh, using this in a strategic way, but it's a, a simple condition. I mean, people have at hand, I, I can talk to people, I'm in a country where I can go out to the streets, whereas somebody could be in a country where they are, forced to be home and they cannot move. This is a very important difference. And it doesn't matter if everybody has access to Zoom, probably they have better information than I have and there is nothing I can do to get that information. And that was something that was not that, uh, it was not that different before the COVID-19 because of its conditions, its restrictions. But I think there is an interesting point here. And I think in multilateral settings, in multilateral forma, it's particularly important, but imagine that we are now in the panel five people or six people plus participants. Imagine you are 100 in the panel, right? In the in the meeting. Mm -hmm. And then there is a, a way in which, you know, people, uh, come, uh, you know, uh, take uh, the floor and uh, they, they speak and so on. 
how do you keep track of everything, right? In, in terms of understanding, uh, yes, I mean, you can hear the words, you can hear the, the but then you say, okay, uh, see, if I look at this uh, a particular diplomat, what seems to be the major issues for that person from that speech, mm -hmm. right? So how uh, maybe I can find in that speech some connection points in my reaction to that? So in a bilateral, that's easier, or a mini, uh, but in a multilateral, then, you know, you, you need uh, some additional tools. I mean, I heard people, you know, using transcription that can identify keywords in a speech so that then I can get an immediate, because as you pointed out, I mean, I'm, I have two years, you know, one brain, you know, how many uh, speeches I can follow. I mean, maybe I need a team, you know, to do that. But Definitely. That I need to identify clear points of discussion in order to be able to move the discussion forward uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a large uh, forum. Definitely. And there is another dimension to this, I think. Um, I was also thinking uh, of an experience we had. Oh, I, it just slipped my mind. I'm sorry. But, but it, yeah, I mean, what, what having a, ah because you have a speech you, you're telling me you're trying your, your friends are trying to find keywords in a speech at least they have a speech you know what happened in it with the COVID-19 is that because it's a health issue and now everything has to be done remotely many countries decided to follow from capital but then in a in a setting in which you used to be among diplomats and everybody knows the rules the non-written rules of how diplomacy works and what kind of information you can give and what kind of information everybody's looking for. But in a setting in which not everybody is a diplomat, it's completely different. And sometimes we had people, counterparts that come from ministries that never had a diplomatic experience before and we needed their input to understand the situation and the person behind the screen was not willing to talk because probably they are not used to do it. Maybe they are too shy. Maybe they don't know if they are uh, allowed to do so. And so probably we were, very often we were in the dark because we couldn't get input from the counterpart in the multilateral sphere. So we sensed that maybe if we had a bilateral uh, meeting, we could generate the trust so that that person felt comfortable in sharing some Input, inputs to advance the negotiation, you see? But I mean, it's a disadvantage in itself. Um, I see Andres is raising the point of recordings, whether the recording uh, of a meeting dilutes or you know, reduces uh, the possibility for, for establishing trust. Do you record your meetings? Well, here in our embassy, we don't. Not because we don't want to, for a specific reason. We haven't found, an, uh, that it, found it necessary. We are also in favor when, we, when somebody suggests, oh, can I record it? We say, yes, no problem. Uh, we personally, in this team, we haven't found a, a difficulty with that. But I can tell you that some colleagues have referred to me that that is an issue uh, for sharing certain information. I don't know that recording for how long it's going to last, who's going to see it where it's gonna end up. So yeah, that is uh, also a problem. And I, I mean, now in the General Assembly, I think it's something that uh, we have to discuss a bit more. It's super fascinating what happened in the high level segment in the, United, in, in the General Assembly, right? Everybody, all the heads of state sent their video messages. And my colleague said, okay, the messages were there. Did everybody see them? <laughs> Who saw it? Who saw looked, what my president said? I looked at, at them, but you know, for a very specific reason, because of the non-verbal communication that is, it comes with those messages. Every leader wanted to uh, send a particular uh, message, right? I mean, with all the surroundings, the offices, uh, different symbols on their desk, you know, there, there's something important about this virtual representation. Yeah. Uh, yeah, when you are at the UN, you have the same desk, you have the same uh, microphone, but now you have the, the, the discretion to rearrange the setting in a way that gives you the possibility to send something, to tell the audience something yeah. interesting about yourself, right? Yes. Not only that you are a great leader, but maybe, I mean, if you, let's say, if you have a, re, a green tie, uh, it's something with environment, right? I mean, that's <laughs> a very yes. good example. So I think it's fascinating in terms of virtual representation and the, the General Assembly messages, very short, generally right because nobody listens to not too long messages very short and i think uh, that element of non-verbal uh, 
uh, display, uh, I found it personally you know, interesting. I don't know whether the others were watching, looking for the same things, but for me, it was quite interesting, the type of signals and symbols that they tried to, to send. Yeah, definitely. And also, you're, you're, you used to have a sense of who were there when, when your president was talking, you knew which, I mean, who other, uh, the, the other heads of state that were in the, in the room when your president was talking. And that in, in itself gave you a message. It's a part of the feedback, right? But now you sent a bottle to the sea, expecting somebody to listen. You don't know who saw it. What was the result? No, definitely. definitely. And also one thing we noticed when we looked at the uh, the speeches at the height of a segment of the UN General Assembly, I mean, as Cornelio said, there's a lot of questions about framing. How do you display yourself? Where is the flag? How do you frame um, the video recording? What kind of uh, additional things um, do you add to this? And these are very interesting questions, but also a challenge because now states and heads of states uh, or government are kind of judged by that. So there, there is a sense of looking at the video, how well it's done, how well it's framed and kind of inferring um, things from that. And I think that's also probably a question for diplomatic training, how to prepare diplomats to, to kind of uh, follow these kind of rules of digital conversation, of video conferencing, of, of recording videos. Why, why do I mention this is because it, it connects to the issue of, of uh... Um, uh, 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 meetings, for instance, where we know each other. I know Dalia from other meetings. I know Catherine. Mm -hmm. uh, I know Rebecca. So it's easy to connect, right? Because you already have exactly. a prior experience. When you don't have a prior experience, especially in multilateral settings, you need visual cues to understand who is this person, what is the expertise, what is coming from. Of course, you can find this, you know, by looking at the document, sending, you know, some messages and so on. But really facilitate, um, make the conversation easier if you can as Dalia said, can read something. So if someone is in the kitchen, uh, you know, communicating from the kitchen, I cannot read much, <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, I can read that, you know, it's very informal person, fine. But I cannot know much about the expertise of the person. I can see the name, then I have to do some extra work. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's that's one reason I use this background because everybody can identify where I'm coming from. Uh, in a sense. Mm -hmm. So that's... Uh, but, but let me use this opportunity to say um, coffee break is officially over. So I hope uh, those who need it get a chance to stretch their legs and um, get a coffee. But uh, this is also a great opportunity to bring in our next um, speaker, um, His Excellency Ambassador Amma Ayuvali, as I said, the um, ambassador of Egypt in Serbia. And Amma, we also had uh, a lot of conversations on, on many of, of these issues. Uh, perhaps... Perhaps uh, let, let me start with, uh, uh, with a question for you, not so much related to the topic of your session, but if you have any reflections on, on the discussion that has been going on so far, if, if you had a chance to listen in. So we spoke about trust, for example, that um, meetings via video conference always have this, uh, the question of trust associated to diplomats. There might be a recording, there might be cybersecurity issues. We also talked about uh, transparency and how that relates to, to going digital. Perhaps uh, you can offer some, some reflections on that. That would be really, really interesting. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Kuhn. Uh, uh, it's uh, such a pleasure to, uh, to join you. I'd like to thank the um, um, Belgrade Office for of Diplo for uh, in, um, for inviting me to participate um, and and of course congratulate you and congratulate Diplo for the wonderful um, uh, report that uh, you've just uh, um, disseminated. Um, I read it all once again today and and the issues that are raised um, are so per pertinent, uh, timely, including the ones that you've just um, you just addressed right now. You know, trust, uh, transparency. Um, security and so on and so forth. But let me first maybe um, just greet um, uh, our dear colleagues uh, in um, in the session. I'm very happy, um, you know, to be making new friends and colleagues virtually. And this actually shows that you can make uh, friends virtually, um, uh, Professor Cornelio, Professor uh, uh, Rebecca, and of course, uh, um, happy to see uh, uh, Dalia once uh, once again. So um, uh, I think. Um, you know issues of trust and, and uh, trust and uh, and hence uh, security and hence uh, privacy um, are, uh, are are paramount. There is no doubt about this because um, because the extent to which um, virtual 
uh, encounters um, um, can disseminate is is by far um, more um, present uh, compared to uh, being um, in person in in situ, and that actually um, you know maybe. It reminds me of the point of entry in, in, in discussing and in analyzing the impact of um, these online meetings and online conferences on diplomacy is that it changes two basic dimensions of diplomacy. First, it changes the temporal dimension, the time dimension, and it changes the, uh, the spatial dimension. Um, uh, you know, uh, like any other um, social activity or, or actually function, um, time and space are the two determinant axes, the two determinant parameters uh, through which any action can be can be interpreted. Um, uh, ICTs um, uh, add an, um, a layer of complexity over how we define the shared time and the shared space. I mean, are are all of us in this um, uh, in this session now? Are we sharing the same um, the same space? Some would argue um, yes, but but it is a different form of space that we are sharing. Are we sharing the same time? I think that's easier. Yes, we are for sure sharing the same temporal dimension. So I think a point of entry is to is to analyze the functions of diplomacy and see how these have been um, uh, are usual are um, implemented and affected by the time and space dimension. Maybe also uh, given the title uh, of the sub session or subsection which I'm participating, um, is the impact the same on bilateral diplomacy and on multilateral diplomacy? I would say there are, um, uh, you know, common, um, uh, common um, uh, and shared um, uh, dimensions of how ICT and online uh, and online meetings impact bilateral and multilateral diplomacy, but also each one of the two has its own specificity. And maybe uh, within our discussion, we can uh, discern and distinguish um, how different is the impact on uh, bilateral compared to the impact on multilateral diplomacy. Maybe one other, um, um, you know, uh, aspect and dimension that I would like to raise as well um, is um, that diplomacy takes place not only within, um, you know, specified time and space uh, um, uh, dimensions or axes or um, parameters, but also it takes place within two different, very different form of um, uh, of interaction of frameworks. One is a formal, and the other is informal. So I would very much propose this. I think, as you reported, in, 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 in frequently and on over um, um, many of its uh, sections and chapters, I would discern and distinguish between the impact of online meetings and conferences on the formal aspect of diplomacy and on the on the other side, on the other hand, the impact on the informal uh, aspects of, um, uh, uh, of of diplomacy, and within this, we would see that you know I would I would say that the three phases, uh, sometimes even sequential phases of any of any um, uh, or, or of most diplomatic activities, be it on the bilateral or even uh, or on the multilateral level. Um, and that is that you know the three sequential phases that we often speak about in our multilateral diplomacy courses. You know the phase of deliberation, the phase of negotiation, and the phase of decision making. And within each of these phases, we will see that there's a totally different um, impact of online conferencing and virtual meetings on each of those three different phases. In fact. Uh, the, uh, the the impact that may be positive on one of these phases may be negative on the uh, on, on another of these phases. Let me give you an example. Deliberations. What are deliberations? Deliberations are um, a time and space uh, phase uh, which allows each participant or each actor to pronounce itself on on the um, uh, on on the issues to uh, express its positions. You have. You and I think other colleagues um, who have just spoke um, mentioned that part about you know the the video messages that the uh, that the leaders uh, have um, were uh, sent uh, during the high level segment, the virtual high level segment of the general assembly. Well, that part is substitutable, you know, because I, I've been you know for 20 or 25 years at, at UN meetings. I have attended um, uh, many of the general assembly high level segments in person, in situ, uh, and now I have attended it virtually. Um, on, and to some extent, there are comparable aspects. Yes, you did mention you know, how um, uh, one could differently frame the picture compared to being in situ in, um, at the UN. But at the end of the day, you listen uh, or you watch the speech or even you read it, you read it in a written format. It doesn't make that 
big of a difference. I would argue at least at this phase. But negotiations, you move from this deliberations phase where you hear each other and listen to each other and the deliberations, and then you get into interaction. Is online conferencing and online negotiations and virtual negotiations as efficient as in situ uh, negotiations? I would argue no. Um, there is a really here, there's a big gap that we need to uh, fill or think about and understand um, uh, how to um, overcome it to some extent. Final phase, decision making. Are the same mode of decision making that are available in situ, replicable uh, virtually and online? I would say to a large extent, yes. But the decision here is not whether it is technically feasible, whether it is actually doable or not. The decision here is going to be whether it is desirable or not. So also this uh, tension between technical and political, I would argue, is a nice prism um, uh, for us to look at. Is, is it doable? Yes, it is doable. Decision making, voting by, this, uh, by um, um, electronic means is surely doable, but is it desirable or not? Well, that's something we need to think about. And the report, uh, which, uh, uh, as I have reread it today, mentions that aspect of things that you know, um, some uh, some parties or some actors may not necessarily want the voting to take place through virtual means, although technically um, um, it is doable. Maybe one uh, or two other ideas that I'd like to share within this introductory phase is also what is encoded, what is codified, what is written. These are rules, and this, the title of our subsessions today is rules of procedure. Sorry. So that, in a way, is is um, is is strict, right? You, in order to amend it or to uh, or to um, uh, modify it uh, or to adapt it and adjust it to the new virtual online world. You need to actually make changes. You need to introduce amendments and modifications. But you know what? Most of diploma, or much of diplomacy, be it bilateral or multilateral, is not necessarily centered only around the rules that are codified. A lot of it is centered about practice and so-called established practice, which basically means if you do it once, if you have a president, you may argue that uh, you can repeat it. And this is an incredible time for the evolution of practice um, and for the establishment of new type of established practice, if we couldn't call it uh, so. Um, so. So it's interesting to discern between these two. When we talk about rules of procedures, yes, they are important in conducting structured debate and structured decision-making, which is what really multilateral diplomacy is about. But also there are these unwritten rules uh, um, we can't call them rules if they're unwritten or unwritten practice that guides us to, uh, through. Finally, 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 one thing I would like to raise is that there are specificities. And one specificity that we all need to be really aware of, and your report did address it, but I really hope that much more attention is given to it, is developing countries. There is just a huge um, uh, uh, different set of challenges that are faced uh, by uh, developing countries and developed countries. And, and I think so much attention needs to be given to the specificity of the case of developing countries, particularly small and, um, and medium countries, um, and how they face this uh, new online world. So this is just maybe some you know, opening thoughts, just maybe more questions than answers, but I think they lead to, and they can lead us all to answers. And I'm happy to engage with uh, the creative ideas that I will hear from this uh, select group of uh, participants. Thank you so much for, for this overview and this uh, basically framework for analysis of space time dimensions, different phases of negotiation. I can already draw this in my head and kind of start start analyzing it. Um, Dahlia, I saw you I saw you nodding uh, quite a bit. Do you, do you want to come in with some reflections on what we just heard? Yes, thank you. Amar, that was brilliant. Thank you for bringing this up. This axis between space and time is something we've been talking and thinking uh, in this embassy as well, because the experience of, an, of, of a diplomat, how would you experience a meeting and what you take away from that meeting is altered by exactly this situation. I mean, if, if you, the, the way memory works and the way you know, or you have a better perception of what the other person took out of a meeting changes if you are in the same space or at the same time, right? It's completely relevant. And I think that um, what Amar just shared with us, this way of conceptualizing what the informal work of diplomacy does and the, inform, the, the formal and the informal dimensions. It's also relevant because I think this is key to convey to any decision maker why it is important that diplomats have this safe space to have these informal interactions. This is a very valuable 
uh, value producer, right? We, we generate a lot of value from these interactions. And as he said, this is not the same online. I don't think if it's possible, probably yes. Uh, this is something that uh, has to be discussed in another setting, but until now, the current, the current um, tools we have cannot reproduce the conditions to have the rich interactions we used to have when we were in the same room. And this is affecting the whole, the whole chain. As he said, I mean, formally, I can send the video message for the UN General Assembly, but without the interaction, without sharing the same space, I cannot take out of it the same value as I used to do. So I think it's brilliant. Thank you, Amar. I, I, I enjoy that very much. Thank you. Good to see you all, Vestalia. And also, this, this is a, a nice lead over to, to a comment Cornelia made earlier, this question of those videos for the high level segment of the UN General Assembly, who actually saw them? Do we know how many people? Oh, we can formally know how many people uh, saw them, but really it's, 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 not, it's, not, it's not quite the same. Um, on that note, Cornelia, any reflections on, on what we just heard from Dahlia and Amer? Yeah, yeah, just uh, you know, for the sake of of, of controversy, uh, taking you know the opposite side of, of what Dalia said, uh, but for, from a different angle. I mean, um, the issue of time and uh, space and time sharing the same uh, sharing the same space and uh, uh, in a sense, you know, the, the validity or the value of uh, what we discuss and take away. I'm wondering whether Ambassador, you know, could comment also on on the issue of where the virtual diplomacy, you know, this kind of virtual medium, has become the great equalizer. Right. Um, uh, so when when you are in the same space with great powers and you know, you know it, it, in a barge meeting there is the issue of prestige, there is the issue of protocol, there is the issue of ranking, but when you are thrown in a virtual meeting, uh, those elements start slightly disappear. Do, do you do you feel that or how how this uh, uh, the virtual changes a little bit the um, uh, unwritten rules of, 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 uh, of uh, power relations uh, that um, otherwise you, you see quite, uh, you see them quite, quite visible in, in face-to-face meetings. Is that your perception or I'm reading it wrongly? Um, if, if you allow me, uh, Kat, uh, thank you, Professor Cornelia. This is a very, very um, relevant point, I think, and the, the report uh, does address it as well when it speaks about protocol and how um, virtual um, uh, encounters may alter the established rules of protocol that diplomacy is well used to. And, um, um, and, and I have seen this among, um, you know, my colleagues and, and I in different frameworks. And to tell you the truth, you know, um, diplomacy is, is, a, is a function, is a... Is a well, as a profession that is a result of years and years and years of traditions. Um, and tradition has been based on protocol for many, many years. And hence stepping away from this established protocol may actually, I think in the eyes of many, uh, uh, decrease rather than increase the opportunity and the interest and the incentive for diplomats to continue to engage of this online framework. Whereas if these online frameworks try to import to you know, um, some of those established practice and, and make it as visually comparable as possible to the institute in physical space, it may um, uh, capture the attention and maybe the interest of diplomats to continue to engage in virtual frameworks, even when, and hopefully we will get to that uh, um, phase, when um, physical and in situ can be equally important. So very, very much agree with you that it, if it's, if it's a, an equalizer, it's, it's a good point on, on its own, but sometimes it has an adverse impact, impact on the willingness and the readiness and the incentive of traditional diplomats, if we call them as such, to engage in virtual meetings compared to in situ. Uh, absolutely. I mean, just to quickly follow up uh, on this with, uh, with an interesting example that I, uh, it was given to me you know, by someone who was preparing the, the meetings, the virtual meetings of Prime Minister Modi. And when I ask them, uh, okay, what is the main fear? What is the main challenge that you, you when you prepare a meeting that you try to, to make sure that uh, you don't have to face? I say, well, it's the connection very technical, the connection. And I was taken aback, you know, where the connection? And then it, it started to down on me because it's also a problem of prestige. If you are in a high level meeting and then the connection drops down, what does it tell you? I mean, it, it dilutes a little bit the uh, image and the symbol is that you as an aspiring country or a great power or whatever, try to send out. I mean, it, uh, 
it, uh, the hard work that we try to put in the substance is being lost on, on the visual representation aspect. So uh, there are certain uh, minor things that you may think is a minor, but all of a sudden you know, they can uh, have a, a great uh, a great negative impact if, if they are not managed properly. If, if you allow me, maybe Kat, I know we may be a little bit over time for that part. Just one, one, one um, point that I would like to raise is that the incredible characteristic of, of ICTs is, the, is continuous change, not continuity. It's continuous change. So anything and everything that one might be saying now about uh, whether virtual and online is actually substitutable um, uh, to in situ or not may be very different um, um, in, a, in the next generation of ICTs. Uh, because now the visuals um, are, are there um, 10 years ago, they weren't. We didn't have this, this form of visuals again. So in fact, uh, any conclusion that we may arrive at too, we should always bear in, in mind that this incredible uh, continuous change in ICTs and its uh, capabilities may actually bring it closer to um, in situ um, in the future. Sorry about the overlong uh, Definitely, uh, definitely agreed. And again, much food for thought, but also much questions about how do we how do we do this in practice over the coming years? What solutions uh, will be found or negotiated? Um, just to uh, go back to um, the, the plan of the sessions we had today, I quickly want to again introduce Professor Cornelia Bjorla from the University of Oxford um, as, as our last speaker for today. Um, and Cornelio, maybe just a few reflections from you because you were part of the conversation throughout, but maybe just to give you the floor again and ask you this question, is the future of um, diplomacy um, digital? Can you, share, can you share some ideas with us? Uh, 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 absolutely, I mean, uh, the, the, thank you very much for inviting me and thank you very much to the panelists and to the participants you know, for, for, for uh, 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 having us. It's, um, I think that the future, I think it's more likely to be hybrid online and offline. I mean, the short answer that there might be, but I think how to answer this question, because when you asked me to comment on this, I, mean, I was reflecting how exactly to answer this question. And I think it's important to understand a couple of things uh, that um, um, uh, as, uh, um, uh, Ambassador Aguayi um, already mentioned, is that in a sense, uh, this is not, it's an ongoing process. Uh, when you talk about the digital transformation, it doesn't start with Zoom, right? We've been part of this process for about a decade, maybe 15 years ago. So the idea here is probably, you know, to try to understand whether there is something um, that we can extract insight from the way in which the digital transformation has affected diplomacy thus far. And that can provide us, you know, some sort of guidance about the direction we are heading. So what I like to, I think that the common thread that we can see, and it is uh, probably the anchor, the conceptual anchor that I propose, is that it's probably not so much about the digital technology, the features of the digital technology that bring new to the way in which diplomats perform their functions, whether it's a presentation, communication, negotiation, traditional functions. But I think what is more important to understand how digital technology changes the environment in which diplomacy operates. So let me uh, explain what I mean by this, right? So, we are now in the second wave of what I call the digital transformation. The first wave was, you know, you know, with the social media uh, dimension, right? Uh, and this is this is quite recent. If you if you want to check, I mean, the the first Twitter accounts go back uh, to the United States uh, State Department in October 2007. The FCO 2008. Uh, UN started it in 2008. So this is quite recent. So what made that possible is that the introduction of this 3G technology, the smartphone and the apps, uh, it created a new environment. It created a new environment because all of a sudden you see millions of people that you can reach in real time directly without filters. So that was the initial drive for many ministers to start to move online in the first wave. There was a new technological uh, 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 progress and that created a new uh, uh, fact on the ground. Millions of people now reachable. And why was that important? Because you can see the impact. So what this, uh, this meant is that all of a sudden public diplomacy become you know, important. So you see that kind of impact in the way to which the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs tried to develop this public diplomacy strategy online. Uh, it was followed by crisis communication, diaspora engagement to a certain extent. So these are the, the type of issue. But I think it also created some subtle changes in the practices that uh, uh, of, of, of the way in which diplomats uh, uh, 
uh, have performed the, or uh, engaged in their work. So all of a sudden, those working with the social media have to become more agile, more creative, more outspoken, right? Think about the language that they used to be before and after social media. Now, it's if you want to make a point, you have to make it in very short characters. And that was the idea, very, to be more, uh, a little bit controversial. Um, it also, uh, this, this uh, the, the social media, the first wave, compressed the time for polit uh, policy deliberation and probably strategic thinking. So that was the first one. What is happening now, as you see in the second wave, is it's interestingly, it was bound to happen um, uh, in, 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 uh, in December uh, 2019. I was putting together with the Commonwealth Secretariat in London or, uh, a workshop to look into the use of virtual meetings. Um, so that was before the pandemic. They were preparing for that. Um, so they already created, uh, you know, they invested in creating the uh, uh, meeting room and technology that allow, you know, member states, you know, to engage in virtual meetings. So there was in the works. What it happened, the pandemic, it accelerated this, this technological trend that we see now in Zoom, on Teams, on Webex. Uh, I think there is, as much as in the first wave, we see this kind of emphasis of public diplomacy and crisis communication. In the second wave, it has moved a little bit uh, in a different direction. What we see now with the virtual seems to favor bilateral meetings for reasons that we discussed so far. I've been analyzing a number of summits, mini summits, you know, the EU summit with China, with Japan. Uh, they seem to be working well. These this summits take place online. They, uh, they are about one hour and they cover a lot of ground. What makes them successful is that there is a lot of preparation um, that is, is produced before them. Uh, so where is, who is losing on the virtual is exactly what you, we see and discuss today is the multilateral setting because you, you have too many and it's difficult to come in. I mean, the problem for me many is how to, to, uh, to, to manage this many to many communication especially in the multilateral setting. There are question of connectivity, there are question of uh, uh, security, there are question of virtual representation. But I think there is something here to see more thoroughly about how this, this uh, virtual meeting actually you know, enhances the visibility of bilateral. And this is why I think that actually on bilateral terms, virtual is here to stay. It provides a very useful framework you know, for, for, for engaging on, on, on certain issues. On the practice side, on the, the way in which the skills, so uh, uh, the social media forced diplomats, those who are on the so public diplomacy to be more agile, creative, outspoken. But what I found interesting with the virtual, it changed a little bit. It uh, demands now from diplomats, those working online to, to, to establish their digital presence, to be able to, it's a different type of game, right? The face to face. Uh, to connect with people in a virtual meeting is not the same as connecting with people in a face-to-face. -face. Um, I've been part of a training uh, with, with some um, uh, UN diplomats a, a couple of weeks ago, and I was uh, impressed by how much they wanted to know about non-verbal communication, which I found kind of particularly interesting, right? In the virtual media, non-verbal communication seems to dominate, hence my references to all the symbolism that I mentioned before. Uh, and you have to remember, I mean, academic studies point out that in every communication, 60% of our communication, even now, is nonverbal. You hear my words, but you also follow my gestures, you follow, you know, whatever happens around me. That gives you a lot of information about how to connect and relate. So this is something that you need to learn, right? And this is another type of skill that has to be added. You can build on the face-to-face -face, uh, experience, no question about it, but the medium creates certain constraints. So that's one thing about the second wave in terms of, but where are we heading? Where are we heading? And then we see now this 5G technology being rolled out, which means what? Uh, speed, right? Um, I mean, in terms of being able, the low latency in terms of response, but also uh, data. Data is likely in terms of uh, information that is being generated, right, to increase by a factor of 30 a lot of information and that creates a challenge for you. If we cope now, we have problem coping with how much information we have to process from this meeting. Then, you know, the type of information that we have to process, you know, in, in a more co complex, uh, it is likely to be quite complicated. I know we are running out of time, but I wanted to, to show you where technology is moving. Uh, and maybe um, there's something to think about that. 
Um, uh, so may I share with you a short clip um, about that is being produced. Is is probably is going to be rolled out, but we have to keep in mind the success in the first wave with social media and the Zoom was made possible because they were accessible. They were not sophisticated. We did not invest a lot of money in it, right? And there was demand. There was an, uh, 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 an environment in which there was demand for that type. So when you're looking forward, we don't need to look to the fancy thing that is very expensive because, you know, it will be very difficult for me to invest into that. We have to find the, the technology that actually have uh, that a mass appeal. So let me conclude with this clip because I found it interesting and, and uh, it says something about the future of, of the profession, right? Uh, how how are we going to adapt uh, if we come Cornelio, back? Cornelio, can I ask you how long how long is it? If it's, if it's a minute, we can do it. If it's longer, we probably will struggle a lot. No, it's very, very short. short. Uh, okay, me, go ahead. Uh, so let's, uh, um, uh, let me uh, put it from, from here. So this is... Uh, 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 let me So that's, in a sense, you know, I'm uh, sorry, uh, that I wanted to share, you know, give you a glimpse, you know, where people are thinking. Uh, is that, you know, the future of the diplomats thinking about in the, in the being able not only to sit here, but also to work in a more, uh, and actually, you know, all this problem of translation. So the technology seems to be evolving and this 5G can make it work in real time. That's the point I wanted to make the connection. Mm -hmm. um, so Azure and the others are working on this. Uh, can be deployed? I mean, this is something to think and whether we'll come back in 2025. I'm not going to speak like this and maybe I'll send my, 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 my little hologram, you know, to give the keynote and uh, uh, me, you know, being in a different place. Uh, that, that's an interesting question. I mean, two questions actually. Is this the future of diplomacy and do we want it to be the future of diplomacy? <laughs> um, on that note, um, thank you so much for uh, the whole panel, uh, for the discussion. It was uh, extremely enriching and I really enjoyed it. And uh, well, we also kind of talked through the coffee break, which is another sign of uh, how things were moving and, and uh, all the points that were exchanged. Um, so thank you so much to, um, to our panelists, Professor Rebecca adler Nissen, uh, Ms. Dalia Salinas, Ambassador Anna Ayuvali and Professor Cornelio Bjoyla. One last step in this whole conference process. The second track is uh, concluded now. So our track here, our discussion is concluded. And now we meet back again in, in the main room for just one overall um, summary of everything. So as you navigate back to the main room and the link is uh, in the comment section, let me remind you this uh, meeting will be available as a video. We will also follow as a video recording. We will follow uh, up with the summary. And the same goes for all the other tracks that you could not see because you joined us. Um, so with that, thank you again um, to our speakers and for a really, really interesting discussion that pointed in so many directions for the future and so many things we need to now keep in mind and uh, keep, keep investigating and keep practicing. So thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. And for those who want to join the wrap up, please join us in the main room. Otherwise, it was great to see you. And I hope to repeat it again very, very soon in person or virtually. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, bye-bye.